Dear ladies and gentlemen, a very good day to everybody here from Zurich in Switzerland, where it's snowing and cold outside. So I'm really happy to join this warm virtual stage where we talk about very, very interesting and crucial topics for our future. This uh, Horace's uh, Asia meeting panel is going to focus on falling GDP growth of China's manufacturing economy. It will last from 10, 15 a.m. to 11 a.m. GMT. And you can trust I'm going to check my Swiss watch here and we will finish on time so that you have enough time also to explore the other sessions happening at the Horace's meeting today. My name is Martina Fox. I'm an international TV anchor and business journalist currently working for China's Xinhua News Agency and I'm based here in Switzerland and also in London. Without further ado, I would now like to introduce my star panelists, very, very VIP speakers that we have today. First of all, this is Wang Hui Yao, or also going by the name of Henry in English. He's the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization, based in Beijing. The next uh, person I would love to introduce uh, is uh, someone who has also participated many times in Horace's meetings in person and virtually. It's uh, Harry Hui. He's the founder and managing partner of Clearview Partners based in Shanghai at the moment. We're also waiting for two more gentlemen joining us, Craig Allen from the US China Business Council, as well as Chip Chu from Keystone Capital in China. We're uh, obviously taking them on board as we go along, and I hope that uh, their connections are going to work as well. Of course, our audience is free and welcome to join us anytime for questions. We want to make this discussion as interactive as possible. First of all, if I may start with you, Henry, you are such an expert on uh, China and the Chinese uh, economy. Are you worried about uh, the falling GDP growth uh, in China and also the manufacturing, you know, economy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martina. It's really great to, to be on this uh, Horace's uh, 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 conference again. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, so, so I, I think the topic of uh, of, uh, of our webinar is that uh, you know they worry about uh, uh, China's uh, uh, GDP's falling manufacturing sector, you know, falling GDP growth of China's manufacturing economy. Uh, actually, I'm I'm not really uh, uh, very convinced of, of that argument. I think uh, first of all, uh, China last year during the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, very severe uh, crisis. China actually maintained. Uh, uh, the only positive uh, uh, major GDP growth in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and this year, I think China has set the, the target for 8%. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the target will be met, um, I'm quite sure of. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, I think the, uh, the first three quarters, China actually uh, announced uh, their uh, growth. I think the, the, the third quarter is a bit below the, the expectation but that's due to the uh, pandemic uh, uh, re rebound and also some some other uh, you know uh, quarantine lockdown uh, measures. But I'm I'm sure uh, you know this uh, this will be uh, uh, overcome, and uh, so I'm I'm quite confident over the whole year uh, we will we'll reach eight uh, percent uh, as uh, as they set out in the target. So so in general, I think there there are some uh, uh, you know. Uh, uplifting quality, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, quality improvement, you know, from high speed economy to high quality economy. That basically, government is doing. So, 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 you, you, there, there's some slowing down of the of the uh, of the growth rate. is is natural because China is already have such a magnitude of its economy. You cannot maintain every year eight percent, nine percent, or even seven six percent because the, the the baseline is so huge now. And then to maintain such a high growth, it's not uh, realistic for any country. But I think maintaining a reasonable growth, it's really uh, possible. So, so and for the manufacturing sector, I think China is still doing fine. Uh, and for example, the import export number yeah. for recent recent for this year actually reached a historical record high mm. you know, for import and export. So, so I think uh, you know I'm not worried about that. There's also digital economy. There's internet plus. There's uh, there's all all the climate change and the things like that. So 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 there's there's improvement on the quality, could be slowing down somewhat, but I, I don't think it will 
then it affect the economy. That Absolutely. Much. And this uh, transformation to high quality growth is really crucial. And policymakers in China and the government is totally aware of this as well. The IMF, as you said, Henry, is also expecting a natural slowdown of the Chinese economy. Um, Harry, what's your point of view? The IMF is expecting, you know, a GDP growth rate of 8% for this year and then a slowdown uh, to 5.6%. Of course, a lot of Countries around the world would still love to see that kind of GDP growth rate. And are you worried about it or are you also optimistic as Henry is? Yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you, Martina, for having me on the panel. And uh, it's nice to be here and uh, see the uh, harasses community again. Um, I actually share um, Henry's point of view. Uh, and I guess I'll share a couple of data points. Uh, I think first and foremost is that uh, the headlines are the headlines, and uh, it's subject it to interpretation and your perspective and point of view. Um, whilst the GDP growth rates might be slowing down, it is certainly off of a much larger base. And uh, really, we, uh, as a private equity investor, we think a lot about macro um, uh, in investment opportunities and where the opportunities are going. And in that regard, we see a couple of uh, reasons uh, to suggest that uh, the opposite is actually happening. A couple of data points. The first data point is that, uh, in fact, the amount of uh, uh, global investors in Chinese exposure to stocks and bonds uh, is at an all-time high in 2021. Um, so it's exceeded over a trillion U.S. dollars. And uh, so if there are global concerns about the slowdown of the U.S. market, uh, the China market, capital is pretty free flow. And, uh, and therefore, um, the capital will be fairly efficient and rational and move in and out quickly. And yet the fact that we're seeing an all time high in excess of one point two trillion U.S. dollars in stocks and bond for foreign investors is probably a sign that there is still a lot of growth ahead. Um, the second thing that I guess uh, we I would say is that if you speak to the multinationals that are in China, um, recently uh, uh, I was at a group and uh, uh, and there was a presentation that was shared amongst a survey of more than 220 multinational companies operating in China. 81% of them said that China remains their number one priority. Second of all, They said that in the next five years, they would expect, 81% of them expect that China will be their largest global market, globally, the largest market globally. Now, these are uh, business leaders, CEOs speaking about what they're faced with and what the growth opportunities are. And the third point that I'll share is that uh, what was interesting in that conversation with them is that many of these CEOs are trying to convince headquarters that the reality on the ground is in fact much more vibrant and positive than what perhaps the headlines might be representing. Absolutely. And there, of course, the media and the journalists are to blame as well because of all these uh, negative headlines. I was just uh, in Lucerne uh, here in Switzerland yesterday at the Europe Forum Lucerne um, talking about China. That was uh, the big topic, of course. And most uh, CEOs there also, one uh, is a former Siemens CEO, exactly said um echoed uh, your comments as well harry and saying that you know china already today is like 30 percent of their market share and they have no interest in leaving the country uh, the same as uh, a recent u.s chamber of commerce survey in a uh, summer um said that, you know even american businesses are not planning to pack up and leave but maybe diversify to other regions as well so Uh, with the pandemic so far and the new variant coming out of South Africa just in recent hours, um, do you expect that uh, we will see, a, a, you know, a kind of a status quo, Henry, when it comes to foreign business uh, in China? Or do you, do you also expect, like Harry said, maybe even a, an increase in foreign business because they see still the potential of the Chinese economy? Yes, uh, I, I, I agree with Harry. What, what, what he just said mm -hmm. is uh, very, very convincing. And uh, but I, I, as a person, I, I live in China and uh, mm -hmm. you know work with uh, different uh, uh, you know uh, sectors and <laughs> and and uh, and business uh, as well. I, I, I actually find that uh, 
you know, you're, 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 you're living a very uh, effective, uh, efficient economy now. And then the synergies there, for example, uh, you have uh, uh, China has two thirds of the global uh, speed railways. Anywhere you go, it's a few hours, uh, you know, not more than seven, eight hours anywhere to China. You know, basically, very, very, uh, all the major centers it was, uh, is connected. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, so that's number one. Number two, now you have uh, 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 one billion smartphone users, you know, have highly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very efficient, you know, everybody's like have a small ERP on their hands and uh, the efficiency communication is, is very, very effective. And, and thirdly, uh, is that, uh, you know, government now is really uh, in a very much better position. Now, it's not like in the old days, uh, the, the, the mountain is high and empires are far away and they are isolated. They don't know what's going on. Now, they, they've been constantly fed by, by the international news that just watched by, uh, you know, different governments, different agencies, and also the, uh, you know, the air all the recommendation from, from international, uh, you know, Financial institutions and, and all the think tanks, mm -hmm. so they can make very quick decisions. And then that that chain of command, that kind of a, a top down or bottom up approach, is very effective here. So, so I would say, you know, with such a, and and and, and, and next, it also China has a huge uh, talent uh, uh, growth. Mm -hmm. you know, they have every ten million people getting out of camp at university every year. Mm -hmm. There's two hundred eighty million people with college degree in mm -hmm. this working population. So, so, so all those added up, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, Harry mentioned about Amchan survey, you can European survey, you know, all, all the business survey, all the business has a strong confidence in China. So I think this is the largest growing market with 400 million middle class, could be 500, 600 in the next uh, number of years. You know, it's still the large attraction for, for mm -hmm. the global investors and, and manufacturers. At the same time, we cannot deny that there is a huge decoupling going on ever since uh, the US-China trade war, the technology war, now the pandemic as well. We've seen disruptions in supply chains, electricity is one. So do you think that foreign business in China just needs to adapt more to the Chinese market and maybe run like a totally different universe, you know, a different uh, business uh, um, line in China than outside? Or do you think that we can still maintain this globalized world and, and, and supply chains? What do you think, Harry? Um, yeah, okay, Harry, okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I would think about it this way. Uh, as an investor, I think it's always important to understand where the macro environment is going and where the attractive um, segments are that is going. And I think China has been pretty straightforward and clear about where the sectors are that they want to encourage. And they've also been very transparent about the areas that they feel are restricted. And to that end, we estimate that there's still approximately 70 plus percent of the economy off of a tr trillion dollar economy. That's still a massive, massive economy where there are significant investment opportunities. And these subsectors would evolve around the areas of consumption, life sciences, uh, health, automotive, etc. cetera. And, uh, and there in that sense, China is very much open to business. So, uh, and then if you couple that with what Henry said a moment ago, the fact that even based on the most conservative estimates, 200 million middle-class consumers will come into the market in the next 10 years. That is probably the type of growth that no other country in the world would have as an economic driver. Now, you couple on the back of that, their per capita GDP will grow from 10,000 US dollars to 20,000 US dollars. Now, Historically, when you trend out uh, the GDP growth consumption, behavioral changes occurs the greatest between 10,000 to 50,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm. How consumers will eat, they go from functional calories to nutritional calories. How they shop, they will go from wet markets to organized trade. In this case, in China, we have leapfrogged into mobile e-commerce, et cetera, et cetera. So, the fact that we will have a huge base of the middle class consumers, the fact that we will see a wealth effect, and the fact that there's still 70% of this economy that is open uh, is, we, in my opinion, still one of the biggest and most exciting investment visas globally for the next 10 years. 
Absolutely. And of course, climate change as well is a huge area where we can all work together so that we don't have a lose-lose situation, um, but actually can all benefit. And that was also the topic of the Xi and Biden virtual meeting uh, on Monday. And they talked for like three and a half hours. So if the China, the Chinese side, they want to use American technology, even like on the climate front. I think that is definitely a good sign and shows that we do have areas of collaboration. Um, we've just recently, a couple of days ago, had also the very crucial political meetings, um, the uh, Central Economic Work Conference, which is usually behind closed doors uh, in, in Beijing. But of course, um, the big news there is that uh, Xi Jinping, the president, is probably going to run a third term, if not longer. Um, what kind of impact will this have on the Chinese economy? Is this going to be a stabilizing factor um, that we see more guidelines, you know, um, the fifth uh, five-year plan, of course, is on track? Or do you think that shows maybe also a little bit of a sign of concern by the Chinese government that things are not as stable as they wish? That's for me. Yeah. If you like to go first. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, no, I, I, I think that uh, they just said uh, uh, six planning of of 19th Party Congress, which I think is uh, is uh, is a uh, very timely and uh, highly uh, watched uh, uh, conference uh, plan. I, I think they they actually cons you know, consolidated the, the, uh, the consensus. They have uh, also summarized the, the centennial experience uh, of the achievement. It's another strong boost, I think, for the confidence mm -hmm. of, of the of the general population, and also you, you know uh, it's a uh, uh, you know more uh, uh, you know a guided uh, uh, direction that people know the country knows how to strike for that. So I think it's it's quite positive viewed here. It's uh, uh, you know so th there's more certainty. Uh, we know that we're going to be in under that direction. There there will be no no changing of the guard. There will be, mm -hmm. there will be positively uh, you know continue. There's no there's no lean back and and things like that. So so. So, so I think you know it's a, it's a greatly uh, uh, stimulating uh, mm -hmm. that we can we'll be sure of, you know uh, that's I think that kind of a top down approach and then that you know like common prosperity, lift eight hundred billion people out of poverty. Now they're working on the several hundred million migrant workers, how to you know build them into middle class. Mm -hmm. So there's a grand objective is really uh, 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 rightly uh, ch chosen, you know, uh, yeah. to cut down the workload of the. Of the, the pupils in the in the in the, in the pressure in, the, in the elementary school and so there's a lot of policy I think that uh, uh, you know optimize the, the, the society uh, in terms of uh, you know for the future development mm -hmm. and, and of and, course uh, what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah. go ahead please Henry mm -hmm. yeah so 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 I, I'm saying uh, basically finishing that is that the the, the the government knows what to do and they set a, a, a target that target for example 45 years plan they already so the uh, one million uh, revisions, comments, suggestions, think tank play a very active role. So, so it, it won't be too big a uh, uh, wrong so for those big major decisions. The, the thing is implementation. For example, infrastructure. Now China has the best infrastructure in the world. U.S. talk about infrastructure. It's taken the first Biden year just to get the infrastructure bill passed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can see how how you know we know what's going to do. It's, it's the, the the key is how to do it. Uh, that's fundamentally. I think China is really effective in, in, in implementing and deliver the outcome of the policy uh, once they made. And of course, China's uh, infrastructure development is also unmatched. I just came to visit you in Beijing, isn't it, uh, Henry? Uh, using the Gauti, the high-speed train from Shanghai to Beijing, it didn't take like five hours like in the past uh, when I was there 2017 it was still that long now it's running in like four and a half hours at 300 kilometers per hour so absolutely incredible what's going on uh, in China but we of course need to stop the uh, decoupling and also open international borders as soon as possible so we can have more cultural exchange. I think this is going to be really crucial. What you've mentioned, Henry, also is uh, the fact that in China we have stability, we have a clear guidance and, and, and guidelines from above the uh, top to bottom approach, whereas in the U.S., Harry, and you are an expert on U.S. and, and economy and, and financial uh, industry as well, we have probably 
you know, in two years, another president, maybe, whether it's Kamala Harris or whether it's uh, Trump again. So things are really shaky, such a volatile situation. It's difficult for international investors uh, as well to gauge. Um, what, what's your point of view on the outlook uh, for the U.S. economy and, and how that might uh, impact the strength of the Chinese economy? Um, I guess uh, I'm a proponent that... Um, that uh, globalization and cooperation uh, is the key. Uh, I'm a proponent that it's been well documented and well proven that uh, we can pursue a win-win scenario and that uh, decoupling has been well uh, documented now by a number of very prominent research that it will lead to uh, inefficiencies and will also lead to, in some many cases, as we're seeing now evidence around the world, uh, uh, inflation, uh, it was at one point considered to be maybe temporary. Now it's widely believed and uh, uh, accepted that this will be a structural change to global costs. Um, so it has been widely proven uh, that it's inefficient and not a, uh, a viable uh, path forward. Um, I also think uh, um, uh, the U.S. and the Chinese economy uh, still have their own respective um, areas of uh, significant growth opportunities and it doesn't have to come at a zero-sum cost uh, and then uh, but what is interesting uh, I think to say is that China has broken a um, possibly a hundred year old paradigm that uh, only liberal democracy or free flow capitalism can create a sustainable social system and that uh, China has paved its own way ahead and created a system that has solved a lot of its own domestic problems and provided an example to the world that there may be an alternative. Uh, and so um, I don't think that it has to be a zero sum game or a one model is mutually exclusive than the other. Um, but I think uh, the countries or each of the markets have to look at its own KPIs and its results say is it serving the purposes of its own people and uh, and uh, and that's where i think uh, i would uh, hope the dialogue would move forward uh, to move towards a a win-win world because it's been well documented with prisoners dilemma that um, uh, that it's always the net net gain is always better when you pursue a win-win scenario we don't only need a common prosperity in China, but in the whole world, of course, and we don't have time for competition, but it should rather be um, a collaboration. Uh, we have a lot of friends in uh, the room as well in our audience. I see Winston there, I see Jim, I see Munir. So a lot of uh, very, very uh, good friends and um, also interested people in, in China, of course. So I would love to open the floor also for questions to make this uh, conversation as interactive as possible. So please feel free to jump uh, in, grab the mic or send us a question in the chat box on your lower bottom to the right side. We have, of course, the next very, very important political event coming up, uh, the Lianghui, two sessions in March every year in uh, Beijing. Um, I used to cover them for the Chinese um, television as well, so I have very good memories of that. It's, it's super important for the policy making and setting of China for the next year and also, of course, uh, setting the growth target. If you were one of the, you know, policymakers in Beijing, of course, uh, Henry, you have a huge influence there as well. Uh, Harry, you too. Um, what would you advise the government right now? What is like the one or two key policy reforms that you would like to see in 2022? Yeah, no, I, I actually, uh, uh, I, I think that the, the coming up uh, two sections are a very, a very important one, which they set the tune for the year, the, uh, the plan for that. One of the recommendations I would like to give is that uh, I, I think, you know, we, China has to probably open up, you know, uh, now the whole world has actually opened. Uh, and then we need to, for example, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, you know, Charles des Affaires told me that they have uh, issued uh, over 100,000 visas for the Chinese students to go to the United States during the pandemic time, actually. Mm -hmm. you know, and then Canada just opened up uh, a few days ago as well. They all recognize Chinese vaccine now. and. Uh, 
What I think is that we China needs to find the optimal uh, point where we can minimize the uh, COVID nineteen occurrence, but also really simplify a bit of the international uh, travel uh, procedures and uh, and also the quarantine and things like that. So so that we can have people coming back. Students, for example, there's not many foreign students being able to come back, but we can really we need them. We have to have them back. But but also on the other hand, we you know, the, the foreign companies uh, the, the, the had the enormous uh, sh staffing problem now, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then they need more uh, global talents to come back. So, so I think, you know, if we can somehow find the optimal way of doing that, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the control of the virus, uh, but at the same time, maximize the, the, uh, the, the talent mobility, uh, that'd be really great. I think that is one of the, uh, the, the, the complaints I heard a lot from all, all the embassies, chambers, and all the yeah, uh, but but also on the other hand, I think we, we really need to uh, uh, maybe we should leave uh, have a long term view with this virus, right? Rather than we we, we keep at the zero tolerance. So that probably one of the uh, uh, decisions I think uh, uh, government has to think in in times to come. And that will also be extremely useful and helpful and important to really promote the cultural dialogue again and. Uh, cross-cultural understanding. We need people-to-people -people exchange. That's absolutely important. I'm a mentor to the Schwarzman Scholars Program in Beijing at Tsinghua University. And just there, uh, a lot of students were able to travel and attend the classes there in person, but of course not all of them. And that is just one um, academic program and we need many, many more. And only that way can we actually facilitate dialogue and hopefully also, you know, fight all the xenophobia and anti-Chinese sentiments in the world and vice versa. Also, you know, the Chinese maybe anti-foreign sentiment that has been rising a little bit uh, over the past couple of months. Um, Harry, if you were a policy makers in Beijing attending the uh, the two meetings, uh, what would be on your top of the wish list? You know, um, I, I'm, I'm probably not qualified to advise on public policy uh, and uh, sure quite in season people but um, from a practitioner investment pers uh, as an investor's perspective uh, I think uh, I would do maybe a few things uh, I think improve uh, increased dialogue and uh, is always always uh, a good thing for the markets uh, to uh, provide uh, communication communication channel it settles the jitters allows investors to feel that there's more certainty. Uh, that That's one thing I would certainly suggest. The second thing I would also suggest is that, uh, in fact, some of the recent Chinese policies are a very, very good net positive for the industry. Uh, I'll, I'll take one example. Uh, uh, the, SA, the SAMR recent initiative on uh, uh, asking the uh, uh, in providing nine guidelines to regulate the internet monopolies in China, uh, those guidelines are in fact a very very good direction moving forward. The fact that we're going to be pursuing more open source systems, allowing cross plat platform collaborations and communication, you could search on one and buy on another, eliminating the exclusivities of, for example, music rights or product exclusivity across platforms. Mm -hmm. All that's going to do is that's going to do is unlock a lot of value on the internet yes. economy, and it's going to create a lot more opportunities for the verticals to emerge. Um, and uh, the banks, the investment banks, and so forth are covering this, and it's reporting the implications and the opportunities they lie. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the fact that it's not even reported around the world. Uh, is of course a good thing to me as an investor because it's this location and that means I could take advantage of this information opportunity and invest, but <laughs> to the rest of the world, uh, you know, they're missing out on some very good news. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic point. Um, gentlemen, I'm going to take a question from the audience, a very, very good question. Of course, we had the Chinese government also increasingly controlling the Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Um, I guess um, it's it's also right to do so because it went a bit wild, wild west, uh, this uh, sphere. So Tim would like to ask, um, what are your thoughts on the digital RMB, e yuan, of course, CBDC currency that's been rolled out and its possible economic impacts. Who would like to go first? 
Harry? Harry, Henry. it's Henry, you. I'll leave that to you. You're the expert. Henry, Henry <laughs> says Harry. All right. Um, you both well, have I to. Can, I can. I can. I can. Uh, you know, Go for it, for, Henry. For, first. Yeah, I can. I can take a take a shot on that. Well, I, I think that <clears throat> China is quite advanced in terms of digital payment. Mm -hmm. You know, whether yeah. Alipay or WeChat Pay. You know, we are already getting into the habit. The PBOC, I think, uh, was the first global yeah. central bank, right, to really adopt yeah. uh, the uh, yuan. But 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 the, the infrastructure is already there. You know, like all the shops are equipped with scanning machines or scanning uh, uh, receivers, and then you know you, you go to the parking lot, you go to the restaurant. You know, I, I don't remember what's the last time I'm, I'm using cash basically. <laughs> You're in New York every day, Henry. Can you imagine like yeah. so many shops, um, like salons and, and and taxis? They still don't accept credit card because yeah. they have to no. pay fees or taxes. It's unbelievable. So, so what I mean is that uh, you know uh, uh, it's already getting to the habit of yeah. the of the consumer of the of this vast uh, population. So, so the uh, PBOC you know uh, launched this uh, RMB uh, currency, which I think will be have a widely application. It's it's the first thing you have to uh, you know cultivate habit. Now the habit is there. You know, just you know you have the most authoritative, you have the most trustworthy, and. Uh, Central bank to issue that uh, that will shift uh, uh, the, the 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 habit uh, uh, over, and then I'm sure China will be one of the most advanced country in, in terms of using digital currency. So that day will come, and uh, so China is taking a lead on that. I'm sure you know we will we'll, we'll have a bright future for that. I'm mm -hmm. sure that we have wide applications for that. Yes, Harry, would you agree? Yeah, I would uh, agree with what mm -hmm. Henry has said a moment ago. And it has been very interesting, like the whole rollout, right? First, of course, like the Chinese, uh, you know, policymakers like to do some special economic zones or some special uh, pilot projects. And slowly but gradually, um, you saw the news releases from the PBOC, how they have been stepping it up and, and uh, really doing a lot of research and development into uh, the currency as well. And it will very, very soon probably be officially launched as well and, and put into use and, and circulation. So I guess China there again is um, ahead of the curve. If there are any more questions from the audience, uh, please um, feel free to ask as well now. One key area of innovation that I would like to focus on too is, of course, AI. Um, Li Kai-Fu, you know, ex-Google executive, of course, for China, has written uh, his book, which is somewhere in my shelf behind, uh, on the global superpower of AI and, and China's role. A couple of years ago, he was really a pioneer in that. Uh, of course, China also plans to become the global AI superpower by 2030 and an industry worth some one thousand um, um, about well one trillion renminbi I believe um, where do you see the biggest potential in this uh, area maybe um, Harry first and, and um, what is in there for foreign companies do you think that Chinese will allow foreign companies to team up and cooperate with the, the Chinese AI players yeah uh, I, I'm happy to take that question um, mm -hmm. clearly partners my firm um, that, uh, that we started nine years ago is a consumer and technology investment firm. And so to that end, AI is very, very much a part of our investment thesis. And uh, in that sense, we are very, very positive and long on AI. Um, a couple of investments that we've made recently that we, we believe will prove to be uh, of very, very significant value uh, will be, uh, we like autonomous driving, uh, EV as you know, is already amongst the highest adopted um, uh, globally. After EV will come autonomous driving. Autonomous driving in that sense will involve a significant amount of uh, AI machine learning, pattern recognition. There are millions and millions of miles that are being driven by AV cars in China already collecting the data and moving that way. And so in this sense, I think that um, AV in China could potentially um, be implemented and adopted in certain instances, for example, in, um, in, in closed uh, in, uh, ecosystems, in the trucking environment and so forth, possibly even ahead of its, the rest of the world in that regard. Mm -hmm. And it's also an issue with an industry that the government is very much supporting. So uh, that, that's where I think AI will have some very, very practical 
and near-term benefit value creation. Uh, yeah. Another business uh, sector that we are very big on in terms of AI and machine learning is in the area of digitizing uh, consumption uh, behavior. Uh, you know, uh, China today is already a six trillion dollar retail market. Thirty percent of that is being happening online. Seventy percent of it is still being done offline. Now, what is happening a lot is there are a lot of companies trying to structure the offline consumption data in previously where it was unstructured. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, these they are observing the GDPR uh, requirements and complying with global standards in terms of uh, data privacy and individual privacy laws. Uh, but mm -hmm. that's going to be a powerful, powerful development in terms of developing and boosting the whole retail market in China and targeting uh, the right messages, the right opportunity and understanding consumer patterns in the offline environment. So those are just a couple of examples of where AI is uh, going to continue to grow. Uh, and then furthermore, if we, if we think about the rollout of um, 5G, uh, the consensus is that uh, uh, 5G will hit its maturity sometime in the next four to five years. Um, but 5G still does not um, solve all the IoT problems. So 6G will be just around the corner. Guess what, you know, just before you knew it, 60 will be around the corner and when that happens the ability to truly have a connected iot world is going to mean a whole lot more data collection and a whole lot mm -hmm. more learning and a whole lot more application to deliver and unlock economic value in this country data is absolutely king and queen henry would you like to add uh, to that question on ai as well yeah yeah, I think I think the, the China has a, has a has a huge application, you know, scene for for this kind of technology. I mean, China is already the the, the, the largest, you know, clean energy auto automobile, uh, you know, market, and uh, and also China is the largest auto market in the world as well. I mean, those uh, uh, applications, in the, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, automation is already there. So. So, so I, I would say, uh, and also artificial intelligence and things like that is uh, is highly, uh, uh, you know, interested by the young people. I and mean, a lot of the talents, uh, you know, go into that sectors, and and, and also government is, is is paying a lot of attention to, to those new developments. So, so I'm 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 thinking that uh, this will be the area where China has a lot of. Uh, uh, and uh, development because China is always uh, fast learning, you know, yes. the internet, mm -hmm. uh, all those things. Uh, you know, China is a quick uh, learner, and uh, and um, I'm very, uh, you know, hopeful that those areas of China will will play out uh, as time goes on. Absolutely, and, we have an uh, Harry, yeah, maybe please. I'll, uh, maybe I'll just add one more point, and that is, uh, at the end of the day, um, AI will come down to a function of the amount of data that it can collect and, uh, and uh, it will allow it. And so in that end, to that end, I think as Henry has said earlier, China will and continue to generate vast, vast amounts of data. And at the moment, much of this data is siloed within different industries. But when that is truly connected, uh, the, the power uh, that it will unleash lock in the, uh, in the AI, uh, its application and proof of concept will be extremely, extremely powerful and lucrative. Fantastic. We do have a question from my friend Munir here in uh, Zurich. He would like to ask you, gentlemen, in light of the dialogue between China and the world, it was said to read the shutdown of LinkedIn in China. We see further emerging media platforms in China like TikTok, Right, Dance, Douyin, and so on, or business platforms that you suggest the West to use to keep in touch with China and their business community. Just as a side remark, I was actually in Beijing about to meet the LinkedIn president for China that day when they had to shut down the operations. Of course, it's now not fully shutting down, but offering job um, websites and, and uh, so-called in-job search for the Chinese uh, employees and employers. Um, but um, what alternatives are there? It, well, it came a bit of a shock for the international business community and journalists as well. 
Henry, you're also a LinkedIn user, and and yeah, no, he... I am, I am. I mean, we had a, a CCG, my think tank. We just get uh, last, last, I think about a week ago, we had a, a big event, launching event with LinkedIn in China. We 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 actually uh, gently conducted a, a analysis and report about uh, you know top ten universities in China, top hundred universities in the, in the worldwide. What's the, uh, the trend and uh, you know uh, the majors and uh, professions of all those graduates? So we did a, a great report on that and has widely reported in China and, and the world. What what I think for the LinkedIn event is that uh, we probably shouldn't look at an isolated event. We we see uh, many companies uh, are not able of internet industry not able to do business with each other. So this is a systematic issue, not not a, a single issue. For example. I mean, uh, we we see we keep seeing entity lists coming out of the U.S. as well. So so, but but I, I still see LinkedIn uh, maintain. Um, the, you know, Dr. Lu, uh, the president of LinkedIn, told me here that they still maintain their large staff and they are not cutting down. They're ex actually expanding. They're just switching a little different focus of business. So that uh, I I think also Chinese government probably has its reason. The reason China is doing so well is that they do not. Uh, have those, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, for example, in the social media, the U.S. is really out of control. There's a lot of, a, uh, you know, the, the divided the society and things like that. So I think I understand government wants to probably maintain some kind of a, 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 a control on that, but so that we can really focus on, on the business, on the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 there's, they still let LinkedIn do big, big business here. So 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 I think there's some adjustment there. But but also this has been. I would have to put into the big contest of, uh, of China-U.S. Uh, business relation, where I think both countries uh, are not, you know, comfortable <laughs> with many things, and uh, so we have to improve the, the you know, the, the overall relation. That's why I think President Xi and President Biden, the summit is so important. Yes. I, I also, like you said, we should have more dialogues. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the uh, you know kind of refocus of LinkedIn China on the local uh, labor market and really you know breeding the um, Chinese talents as well. That also shows the agility of uh, the business in China, like how fast they are in adapting to new circumstances, new trends, and uh, new reforms, and so on. Um, what was your view, Harry? I guess you're also a frequent uh, LinkedIn user. Yeah, I. Well, you have VPN, so that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I, I would support what Henry said and uh, wouldn't have much more to add to that. Yeah. 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 Um, we are very, very soon um, finishing this panel already. If there are no more questions in the chat group, I'm just going to take one last look. Okay, fantastic. So I would already have to close it here um it's been a great pleasure to see you again henry and harry as well of course thank you so much for your insights and as i mentioned uh, i guess you're both on linkedin so people can connect with you here in this uh, group as well to stay in touch and uh, follow all the latest developments in china and uh, let's hope that the world is going to reopen again soon and we can have this um you know investment flows and and of course the cultural dialogue and exchange which is uh, so crucial and Thank i wish you all the best already for the new year i think it's the new year of the tiger lao hu oh, yeah, is it yeah, yeah hopefully yes okay great okay thanks uh, well, uh thank thanks so yeah. much for joining us today Thank you, everybody. Stay in touch. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martina. Bye.